Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Bill Doley, the President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. You've got uh, Shannon Cowell. I'm from a preservation archaeologist here at uh, the Archaeology Southwest and Kelly Jenks, who's uh, at her home over there in, in Las Cruces, but she's at New Mexico State University. So um, thank you uh, for our speakers tonight and thank you all for joining us. This is our 14th year of doing archaeology cafes. Um, and this is just uh, the third of our events this season. And all of the um, sessions this year are focused on work that our staff here are doing, sometimes in partnership, sometimes um, they're solo presenters. So we're honored to have uh, a team tonight. And so Linda and I and Shannon are all downtown in Tucson at our uh, Archaeology Southwest office, and Kelly is over in Las Cruces. We like to make a land acknowledgement of the places that we um, are presently living and uh, recognize the traditional territories here in Tucson of the Tan Autumn uh, Nation and over in Las Cruces. Uh, you've got the Suma, Manso, and Apache um, native peoples who um, used that landscape and was their traditional territory in the past. So given that we're all spread across uh, uh, the country tonight, uh, so think about the native peoples who were um, you, your traditional land or where you're today um, and, and the traditional lands of, of those peoples. And we wanna say some thanks. Um, this is a sponsored program of Archaeology Southwest. So the, the uh, Smith Family, Tr the Smith Living Trust is our key uh, sponsor for this program. Thank them very much. Uh, you will be able to, while we will be recording this, um, you will be able to ask questions. Um, and there's, if you run the mouse over the little space at the, the bar at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little Q&A option down there. You can type in questions and Linda will be uh, coming back at the end uh, to present those questions to our speakers. And you may hear from time to time the train go through here in Tucson and Kelly claims to have some dogs that are wanting to perform tonight. So, uh, you know, it's a laid back um, get together here. So we won't stress over this noisy train that's getting closer as I speak. So the tonight's talk, I'm just gonna let um, the two of, of our speakers, uh, <laughs> actually I'll consume a little bit more time while the train um, <clears throat> revs through town here. This is work that, that Shannon uh, worked with Kelly uh, on Shannon's ma master's thesis is, is the uh, sort of the focus of tonight's topic. The title, I think, is uh, particularly uh, appropriate for this, what I feel is like a calming time of the year. Um, Beloved things, micaceous bean pots, and connections to the Hispanic New Mexican homeland. So Linda and I will disappear, and uh, we'll let uh, Kelly and Shannon take it from here. We'll see you at the end of the talk. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so historical archeologists often view curated heirloom or hand-me-down pottery as a problem because it skews the relative dating of sites. As an example, I might imagine my own household turned into an archeological site and the dishes I use every day easily predate my rental agreement by like 20 years on average. But we can ask interesting questions about why these artifacts were curated and what their presence tells us about the values of the people who use them and maintain them. In my thesis research, I encountered a similar story, a few small sherds of micaceous ceramics common in the first half of the 19th century in Northern New Mexico were found in a distant Hispanic village settled in the late 19th century on the middle Pecos called Los Ojitos. Kelly directed a field school at Los Ojitos in 2014 and recovered just a few micaceous sherds. This is a time and place we wouldn't expect to find these sherds. They, don't, they aren't included in ceramic typologies for the area. 
it appears that just a few precious bean pots were transported with the initial migration of families from northern New Mexico. These pots were maintained for several decades and probably handed down between generations of women. Kelly and I started thinking about this again in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there were a ton of articles and social media posts suggesting that people reacted to the disruptive and frankly scary events by returning to more traditional food practices. Things like baking sourdough, planting victory gardens, or canning produce. One article in the New York Times explored a woman's newfound interest in cooking in cast iron and the ways using this old timey technology connected her to her maternal lineage who survived calamities like war and pandemic in the early 20th century. It became really clear that resurrecting old, familiar and ancestral practices provides a coping mechanism and a way to soothe anxiety. We all need our favorite comfort food sometimes. This inspired us to revisit the evidence presented by these few micaceous bean pot sherds at Los Ojitos. In the next few slides, Kelly will introduce the historical context of the site. So with a little bit of beginning kind of early with Hispanic colonization in New Mexico, the Spanish conquered and colonized Northern New Mexico in 1598. And for the next couple of centuries, Hispanic settlement concentrated mostly along the Rio Grande, the Upper Pecos River and their tributaries. And this um, is known in some circles as the Hispano homeland. In 1846, these lands were conquered yet again, this time by the United States. And after New Mexico was incorporated into the US as an American territory, American immigrants and land speculators began encroaching on Hispanic New Mexican lands. And especially the uh, common lands that were reserved for grazing sheep and cattle. And consequently, many of these Hispanic families were forced to seek new lands outside of the area that had been home to their families for generations. The first of the American Homestead Acts was passed in 1862, and this made it possible for some of those families to settle and claim uninhabited lands farther down the Pecos River. The village of Puerto de Luna, um, which maybe Shannon can, yeah, it's where the cursor is moving right there, was first settled by Hispanic homesteaders in that same year in 1862. And it quickly became the social and spiritual center for um, the smaller satellite communities that formed later. Also in 1862, at a location about 40 miles downstream, the US Army established Fort Sumner, right there to manage the Bosque Redondo Indian Reservation, which confined thousands of Navajos and hundreds of Mescalero Apaches um, between 1863 and around 1868. The fort and the reservation required food and supplies, and this provided a market for local farmers and ranchers. Los Ojitos, in this context, was first settled in the late 1860s by a small group of Hispanic families who occupied and later filed claims on a portion of the river valley uh, just past the northern boundary of the, the Bosque Redondo Indian Reservation. Their nearest neighbor was John Gerhardt, a retired German-American soldier from Fort Sumner who claimed the lands immediately downstream. And the nearest large village was part of the Luna, was located um, about 18 miles by horse or wagon upstream. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, in this context, during the late 1800s and early 1900s when Los Ojitos was occupied, New Mexico's population was highly segregated along racial and ethnic lines. So Hispanic and Anglo families especially tended to be clustered together in different neighborhoods and different regions, each speaking their own language, attending different churches and maintaining their own cultural traditions. Relationships between the two were sometimes close, but often strained, especially where these populations competed for land or resources. Um, and Hispanic New Mexicans were much more numerous, especially early on, had a longer history in the region and better understanding of the land, 
but they were often treated poorly by Anglo-American immigrants who viewed Mexican culture and traditions as inferior to their own. Um, and in fact, some of these American concerns about these supposedly inferior cultural influences kept New Mexico from, for, from being admitted as a state um, for decades after it was annexed into the United States. So within this context, in a place and time where these practices were both notable and somewhat stigmatized, the villagers of Los Ojitos held on to their language, their beliefs, and their traditions. Uh, Spanish was the dominant language spoken throughout the village's history all the way through to the, the sort of final census records that we have. The residents were practicing Catholics, attending church in Puerto de Luna, and marking their landscape and the graves of their family members with crosses. And the women continued to use micaceous bean pots to prepare meals that were familiar and comforting and distinctly New Mexican. Can you go to the next slide? So their maintenance of these practices here, far from that Hispano homeland, that core territory, uh, to us brings to mind the concept of querencia. Querencia is a Spanish word that literally translates to something like longing or desire, but which often refers to a specific longing for a familiar place, a place where you feel comfortable, where you feel safe, where you feel like you belong. In New Mexico, this concept has particular resonance for Hispanic New Mexicans, many of whom see this connection to place and a longing for, for homeland as an essential part of their identity. So with this in mind, the maintenance of micaceous cookpots can be seen as a reflection and expression of this longing for home, this cadencia. And this brings us um, back to the pot. So Sangre de Cristo micaceous pottery is made from micaceous clays from the Sangre de Cristo mountains in northern New Mexico. These clays have supplied potters with a durable medium for utilitarian cookware for centuries. The clays are primary and residual, which means they form in place from weathered rock, and they consist of up to 80% mica by weight. Mica tempers this clay naturally, and because of its platy structure and low conductivity, it makes a really good temper for cook pots. These wares were produced by Hickory Apache, Pueblo, and Hispanic potters. The Hickory Apache specialized in micaceous ceramic production, especially large volume cook pots intended for trade with Hispanic villages. Women were the primary producers and consumers of these wares. This inter-ethnic barter system of micaceous pottery included both raw materials like clays and slips and also finished vessels. The Hickory Apache moved between Hispanic villages to trade their wares. And then the Americans show up. Um, Indian agents report Hickory Apache production on the upper Pecos River into the early 1850s, but the Hickory Apache were increasingly confined to a shrinking area in the north. Decades of displacement, famine under the ration system, and the forced removal of the Hickory Apache to their reservation in 1887 ended or reduced traditional subsistence practices. And micacean, micaceous ceramic production is just one of many examples. So this historical evidence suggests that the early settlers of Los Ojitos brought micaceous pots with them as they migrated and they were unable to replace them very easily because they were on the spatial periphery of the Hispanic New Mexican homeland. The archeological evidence at Los Ojitos supports this really well. Um, the Sangre de Cristo micaceous sherds found here are again found far behind, outside of their typical distribution area in Northern New Mexico. And they appear in very low frequencies compared to sites in the north and within the site compared to the frequencies of American produced ceramics. Contextual clues um, indicate that these micaceous pots were curated and deposited several decades after their arrival at Los Ojitos. Many sherds were found in context alongside items like car parts, a plastic music disc fragment, and a Vicks Vapo rub jar. There's also this 
kind of strange jar shirt with red temper paint on it, which is really interesting because it obscures the mica and I'm not sure temper paint could survive the cooking process. Um, so this all suggests that the pots were maintained and used for several decades. And that's a really long lifespan for an earthenware cook pot. Usually they only survive about a year or so of daily cooking. This map shows the section of the site that Kelly worked on during her field school. And you can see the collection units and test units where micaceous pottery was found. And it's at several home, it's found within several homes. So it's not an anomaly at a single spot. It's pretty widespread throughout the village. So why were these cook pots curated? Why did people hold on to them and pass them down through generations? The maintenance of these ceramics is a testament to how important they were to the women of Los Ojitos. They're the only utilitarian um, earthenware type brought down from Northern New Mexico. And there are underlying values behind that decision. Not all objects are equally likely to be brought along when we move to new places. So materiality is a theoretical perspective underlying much of what we do in archaeology. It helps us understand people's ideas, values, and our relationships through the lens of material culture. Our daily practices express our underlying values, and material objects play a role in this process because they set the scene for our lives. Everyday items like cook pots can be significant, even if we're not consciously aware of it because they shape our domestic environments, our cooking practices, our cuisine, and our identity. Migration and other stressful situations can disrupt the pattern of everyday life. In moments of crisis, we often find our attention drawn to everyday objects and practices as a way to maintain a feeling of normalcy, express our identities in a new setting, or simply connect with and remember the past. The heightened significance of material objects is explored in many contemporary studies of migration and diaspora. It's a way to cope and feel at home in a foreign and sometimes hostile environment. So in the following slides, um, Kelly and I will take you through some of the reasons why micaceous ceramics became beloved things at Los Ojitos. First of all, the beans just taste better. Micaceous bean pots are treasured by cooks and potters alike. They are superior vessels for slow cooking. The late Felipe Ortega, a well-known Hickoria Apache potter, considered micaceous pots an essential tool for making palatable beans. And that's his quote at the top. They give an earthy, mineral-rich flavor to cooked foods like stews and beans. Um, Martha R Romero of Nambe Pueblo described this flavor as a taste that appeals to anyone who ate dirt as a child, myself included. Mica makes a resilient and durable temper because of its platy structure and low conductivity. This makes the pots more resistant to thermal shock and helps explain their durability and their longevity. There's really no equivalent in mass produced American wares. You can't recreate the same beans in an enamel ware or metal pot. And I wanted some practical experience with these pots. So I took a ceramic workshop with Clarence Cruz, a potter from OK Winge and a professor at UNM's art department. And I use this pot pretty regularly, almost weekly to make beans. And it, the process takes about six hours which, so it's only really possible now that I'm working from home. Um, there's a particular way to take care of these pots. They're a lot like cast iron. You don't use soap or abrasive sponges or tools to preserve the seasoning on them. And you have to be careful heating them up slowly and evenly. So one of the biggest reasons why they kept these pots is because they work really well and they last a long time. So as Shannon mentioned before, the things that we do and the objects that we use every day are often so normal that we don't really notice them or think about them. They become almost invisible. But when something happens to disrupt our normal everyday lives, like for example, moving to a new place, we can suddenly become aware of those everyday things and they can take on new layers of significance. 
And I wanted to give an example that isn't specifically from this research. And I was drinking coffee this morning. So this is my example. So many of you probably drink coffee in the morning out of a mug. Um, and you probably didn't really notice the mug that you were drinking out of this morning, or maybe even the process of making it, maybe you were half awake and it just kind of happened, right? But in a new unfamiliar setting, if you move to a new place, that mug, when it comes with you, might suddenly become noticeable. It might become comfortingly familiar, right? like something from home. It might even become cherished as like a marker of who you are and where you come from. And if you move into a new unfamiliar cultural setting, that you move to a new country and you're in a place where people don't really make or consume drip coffee um, the way that many Americans do, then this mug and the, the coffee making rituals associated with it might take on even more layers of meaning. So you might come to see making coffee in the morning to be an essential part of your own cultural identity, who you are, right? This is where you come from, this is your heritage. Um, and it's also probably gonna become more challenging to maintain this practice. You're gonna have to find the right kind of beans, the right grinder. You're gonna have to maintain the tools that you have because they're gonna be harder to find. And in this setting, your new neighbors are also gonna be aware of this practice. They might see your dedication to drip coffee as something that's strange and distinctly American, like my Australian cousins who find it weird and a little gross <laughs> that, that I make drip coffee as opposed to espresso, right? So it can be associated with almost a kind of stigma as well. So the micaceous cook pots that we're talking about, they, these were likely mundane everyday items to the Hispanic villagers living in Northern New Mexico in the mid 1800s. The women who brought these down to Los Ojitos though, would have likely become aware of them in this new setting. And because they lived in a cultural borderlands, these women also were likely very aware of the role that these pots played um, or that they played a critical role in the preparation of traditional New Mexican cuisine, how to make the food taste right, um, and especially the preparation of things like beans. Their Anglo neighborhood or neighbors in this new environment would have been aware of this too. Um, and in fact, you get plenty of accounts, sort of contemporary accounts of these times where Anglo-American immigrants in New Mexico make specific pointed comments about the ubiquitousness of beans in, in Mexican cuisine and the ubiquitous presence of these earthenware pots. So it might have even taken on a certain amount of, of kind of racial stigma in that context. So for the women who used and maintained them, these cook pots and the cooking rituals associated with them were likely meaningful on multiple levels as mementos of home, as part of a cuisine that was essential to their identity as Mexicans and new Mexicans, and also as a signifier of that identity to the, their new people that surrounded them. I also think there's something specifically metaphorically rich about these pots in particular because they're made out of the actual earth, the clays of that homeland. So they're literal pieces of home. And because of the ways that they're seasoned, every time you prepare a meal, it, it sort of absorbs into the clays. They're literally imbued with the essences and memories of past meals. Next slide. So that physical connection to memory is also really important. Memories connected to place, but also and especially memories connected to people. So Helen Holmes, who's a, a British sociologist, has written about the under-acknowledged role that objects play in reproducing and sustaining family relationships, kin relationships. So whether it's hand-me-down clothes or a memento from, from your wedding or an inherited cast iron pan, people oftentimes perform these family relationships through things, through objects. And archeologist Lynn Foxell uh, provided a really great example of how inherited objects can maintain, but also even create emotional ties between family members um, and close friends in the absence of face-to-face -face contact. 
She describes a wooden spoon that originally belonged to her grandmother's sister, um, which was then passed down to her grandmother and then eventually to her, and then eventually was used by her own daughters. So this spoon was connected to stories of a woman who she'd never met. Her grandmother's sister had died before she was born. But this person became real to her through the stories that her grandmother told when she used this spoon. And in the same way, her daughters came to know their maternal ancestors through the stories she told as they continued to use this spoon. So through this object, these women became alive and these relationships um, were formed and maintained. I think the same kind of memories were likely associated with these micaceous bean pots at Los Ojitos. Um, Charlie Carrillo, who conducted some uh, early research on these micaceous cookpots in Northern New Mexico and did a number of interviews, observed that oftentimes these pots were passed down from mother to daughter. Um, like in the case of, of the quoted passage we have in the bottom right, where Mrs. Turillo inherited from her mother one of these micaceous pots and used it until the bottom wore through completely in the 1940s and then couldn't replace it. For generations of women at Los Ojitos, I think cooking with these pots connected them with the textures and the smells and the flavors of the women who came before them. And by using these pots, they also nurtured and sustained those, those familial ties. So one of the most important questions any archeologist should ask themselves about their research is why does any of this matter? We can think about carencia as a way people handle dislocation and disruption and a way to navigate our longings for home, familiar places, family, and a sense of belonging. Rodolfo Anaya, the author of Bless Me Ultima, which also takes place in a similar small village on the Pecos River, not too far from Los Ojitos, occupied at the, about the same time. He described, described Carencia as a love of home, a love of place that can be deliberately constructed and maintained no matter where you are or who you're with. He extends this idea to the Hispanic New Mexican diaspora and to everyone else on the move, displaced, deployed, or incarcerated. It's a part of emotional life that provides a source of safety and strength and a personal narrative of home and belonging. When creating a new life in a new home, in a new place, decisions to keep and maintain specific artifacts or items reinforce carencia as it lives in material objects. This helps us see how responses to stress and disruption can appear in the archeological record. The last 400 years of colonialism resulted in mass migration, including both forced and voluntary movements of people across the planet. The last two centuries of rapid technological change resulted in new tools to be adopted readily or reluctantly. So most historical sites hold material evidence of curation decision-making by relocated or displaced people who likely experience some forms of stress, social isolation, or discrimination in new environments. Taking a close look at problematic artifacts can reveal the social and emotional realities created by change and disruption. For the women of Los Ojitos, micaceous bean pots provided a way to maintain tradition and remember loved ones left behind. So the 20th century was full of stressful events like wars and pandemics, and it looks like we're in for more. Um, mass migration and trauma are likely to occur, occur because of climate change and political instability. COVID-19 might have just been a practice run for many of us. And looking back at this story from Los Ojitos has helped Kelly and I understand our own experiences and better empathize with these women of the past. So we're curious about what you find beloved, what connects you to your family, to your heritage, and what makes you feel comfortable. What do you turn to when times get tough? We 
We also would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, the many people living and, and gone who've assisted us in this research, particularly the descendants of the Los Ojitos community, including Ernesto Chavez, who's depicted with some of his family in the left, um, who came to, to visit the site and, and talk about his memories of the site. Um, archaeologists Jeff Hansen and Mark Hunkerford of the Bureau of Reclamation's Albuquerque office, who permitted and supported this work, um, and the students and staff who worked on this project, both in the field and, and subsequently with the materials and the ideas that we brought back. Um, but above all, we'd really like to acknowledge the women who made and exchanged and passed down and cared for and cooked with these pots. Thank you very much, you guys. That was fascinating. That was really wonderful. You've got me thinking now. And here's the train. Okay. Just, you know, we we're going to, the train is, it's not a thing, but I think I would put the train as, as a sign of my hometown in Tucson. But anyway, um, so yeah, we've got some time for some questions if you guys are ready. Um, let's see what, um, let's see what kinds of questions we have. Um, that look like interesting. Here's one. Um, she says, uh, fascinating and asks, are there other objects from Los Ojitos that are displaced at home, perhaps associated with outdoors labor? So is there anything else that you, you saw there? It's a really good question. Um, and I don't have a really great answer, unfortunately. We, the pottery was the most um, obvious non-local item that was recognizable to me as somebody who'd worked further north uh, in, in sort of the upper Pecos villages of places like San Miguel. Um, and in fact, a lot of Shannon's initial research was trying to, to make sure that this was in fact that same type of pottery and not something that might have been local, that might have been historic or, or prehistoric, that might have been just not yet no typology had been really adequately addressed. Um, it was the main thing that stood out. The, the architecture is consistent with kind of what you find upstream. So people are still making houses in the same way. You see the same corner fireplaces, um, the same kind of uh, use of, of storage structures. That might be the, the best example I have of some another tradition that kind of partially comes down here and also um, is a little bit different in this area, which is rather than having soterranos, like the, the subterranean storage features, um, there are some of those here that people tend to build as almost like dugouts initially live in and then build houses and then use as storage. But in some of the houses, rather than having soterranos, they had these uh, about a meter square stacked stone little mini structures. Um, and they seem to, there were a few competing ideas and, and suggestions about what they were, um, but what they appear to be are uh, sort of outdoor storage structures that also functioned as chicken sheds, uh, little chicken coops, and they're called coyes, which comes from, from a Puebloan word that refers to kind of the lower, um, the lower floors in a multi-room structure that are also used for storage. And so, it is, it's connected to technologies and traditions of Northern New Mexico and of, of Puebloan context in New Mexico too. And that was really interesting. Unfortunately, things like metal tools and that, that, that which might've been brought down um, didn't survive nearly as well. And so it was harder to see anything distinctly non-local there. Yeah. Um, what happened to Los Sojitos itself? Is the village gone? It, uh, <laughs> I mean, so the village is now an archaeological site, um, and the portion that is, is kind of the core of the village where, where this archaeological work was conducted is on um, public land where there's limited access. So that this, the field work that we did in 2014 um, was really largely management oriented to make sure to properly locate and record all of the structures um, and, and do a little bit of test excavation to help 
sort of delineate when different places were occupied and by whom. Um, but the, the site was mostly abandoned by the 19, early 1950s. And it's kind of at a point on the Pecos River where there was a dam constructed downstream um, beginning in 1937. And so while it didn't, this isn't really, it's not underwater, it is within the flood zone. And so for people who might have been utilizing um, the, the lower parts of the river valley, or even just because there was a danger of flooding from that, um, a, a lot of people elected to leave and, and eventually sold the land back to the federal government. And it kind of ties in with other developments that you see throughout rural New Mexico in this time where the sort of combining effects of um, World War II, especially, and, and kind of the not only men leaving for service in the war, but families unable to sustain and, and kind of manage farms and also seeking employment in manufacturing industries, many of which were associated with warfare. A lot of these rural communities are mostly abandoned during the same time period. Excellent. Um, so there have been some questions. What, uh, what other kinds of ceramics were found in the assemblage, Shannon? Um, is there other kinds of things? And sort of related to that, someone was asking whether there's, did you look into any kinds of, is there any sign of anything moving up from Mexico or would that, would that have been earlier? Um, I think there's a lot of American produced tableware at the site. Okay. Um, Kelly can speak a little bit more to that perhaps, but a lot of what you'd expect to see at an Anglo homestead, plates, mm -hmm. cups, crockery, that type of thing. That, I, yeah, I would add the same. And you have the construction of a railroad line through Santa Rosa by 1906. And so there was, in a lot of ways, easier access to these American imported goods than there would have been to things that were coming from Northern New Mexico, right? So earthenware pottery would have been difficult or more difficult to obtain. Um, it's a lot of what you would see at other settlements in the area that are near the railroad and a lot of whiteware, yellowware, even porcelain, um, but especially the tablewares more than the cooking wares. And that's one of the things that made finding the micaceous pottery fragments so interesting. We don't see much evidence of materials coming up from Mexico, but, the, but it would have been a sort of more challenging route to import those materials to this particular site. Um, and I think this, I think the, the questioner is asking, um, do you have any sense of how old these pots are that you're actually, these micaceous pots, you're just sort of saying decades or do you have, I mean, hundreds of years or do you have any idea how old they might really be? It seems like the typical lifespan could be up to like 60 to 80 years, which is really impressive. Um, and the pots, there's at least one shirt that Cimarron micaceous, which is produced by the Hickory Apache. So that's probably made before 1880 or so, and probably more like the mid 19th century. Great. There have been a couple of questions. Folk are sort of interested in um, if you can speak any more about like is it possible to find a good micaceous bean pot nowadays? Um, if you had one, how would you cook with it? Um, can you speak at all a little bit more about um, just the basics there? So there are a bunch of artists who still produce these wares and sell them. Um, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque comes to mind first. Um, mm -hmm. And they're pretty expensive, usually in the hundreds of dollars. So the workshop I took was only maybe $200 and I got to make my own pot. So that was pretty exciting for me. Um, if you get one of these pots, um, you basically heat it up in the oven for about 20 minutes. So it heats evenly. Um, you can make anything that is slow cooked like stews, beans, anything with like gravy, that type of food. Um, you can transfer it to the stove. And I use, we have like a glass cooktop, which is a little scary to use with these pots, but so far it's been okay. Um, 
you can buy things like a trivet to kind of put some distance between your pot and the um, stove top if that's necessary. And usually you just keep the pot on at low heat for like four to six hours. Um, and then you don't use soap, you don't use sponges or metal tools that helps preserve the pot. Well, your, your question to the audience is, is um, generating some really wonderful sort of um, comments. I thought I might read a couple if you guys don't mind, if you'd like to hear what some people are saying. Um, a friend of ours, Kate Sarther says, um, I'm right now mere feet away from a chocolate pot, a cheap one from the late 1800s that was still in my Irish American grandmother's china cabinet because it was something fancy to her mother who'd come over in the 1910s. I'm looking at my great aunt's copper pot that I don't use. I'm looking at several small but long treasured pieces of Waterford crystal and Belique pottery. These are all on an open shelf within reach. So, and um, God, I saw some, I, there are some others here I, I wanted to read. Um, here's one says, just says that my mother gave me a gift of her Boston bean pot that you used many decades and I use it now. Um, um, this presentation encapsulated my Thanksgiving. I eat the same foods we had 50 years ago, such as rutabaga. I use my mother's pans and cookware. The important thing is that it being back, the bring, bringing back the past to another place. Um, so there's been really, and here's one. Um, my father had a sabbatical in Australia. My mother had packed my, our, my silverware set, a fork, knife, and spoon in child size with our household goods. I was delighted to discover them in a strange land. So I think what you guys are talking about is definitely um, resonating with us as well. Um, let's see. Um, find some harder questions for you if we have a couple more minutes. Um, here's someone, an anonymous, he's asking that he found some micaceous sherds on a circa 1860 Mescalero site near Fort Stanton. Would this suggest a connection with the Jicaria through marriage? I think they did have social connections <clears throat> and I found a little bit of evidence that suggested that they had, they made their own micaceous pots, but it's not necessarily as associated with the Northern New Mexican ware typology. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't surprise me to hear that there's a micaceous ceramic found in this context. Um, here's a good and interesting one. Um, it says, I understand that the emphasis for the presentation is on the pots and the archaeological artifacts, but regarding the people, especially the family um, Chavez, do you know where those people came from before settling at Los Ojitos? Um, I was wondering where you, if you know specifically where they came from. So the short answer is no. <laughs> Uh, longer answer is kind of. Um, a lot of the families who first came to Los Oitos came from nearby communities like Puerto de Luna. Um, Puerto de Luna, the, the people came from a variety of locations, but a lot of the families that I've tracked seem to have come from further upstream on the Pecos. And so you had Spanish and later Mexican land grant communities at places like San Miguel de Vado, Anton Chico, a whole sort of um, stretch of, of these settlements dating to the, the Spanish colonial and the Mexican period. And it a lot of families from those same communities as, as the, the kind of, there were new kids, the kids needed new lands or, and especially as you have some of that land encroachment happening and land speculation happening up north around places like San Miguel um, that made it really hard to, to continue to graze sheep because they're, they were getting increasingly confined. Um, a number of those families are among those who move down. And so some of the, the sort of lineages that I've been able to trace are people who've, who mentioned knowing where their family members come from, they're coming from, from further upstream. But I've seen other references as well. I've seen people talking about coming from sort of out by Bernalillo. Um, there have been some references to the Rio Bonito area. 
So I think it kind of depends upon the family and tracking these families can be complicated. Our, our best records are sort of census documents and church marriage records, but um, you're also looking at relatively large families where a lot of the same names appear many times, many generations over, sometimes same names in the same families. Um, and especially in some of these rural areas that, that might be about it, there's not always a, a pretty, there's not always a lot of records um, and it's not always clear even if you were looking for things like marriage records for somebody who shows up in one census and then isn't present in the next one, it's not always clear where they came from. So we don't have um, always a lot of information. With Ernesto Chavez, his family actually didn't, he didn't live in Los Ojitos, but he worked in Los Ojitos. So his family lived a little bit closer to part of the Luna um, and, and in, in that vicinity, but he, since he had worked um, kind of as a, primarily with cattle and sheep, um, he was familiar with the Ronquillo family, which were on the sort of west side of Los Ojitos, that was their homestead claim. Um, but so we have a, a sort of general sense of where people came from, but it's hard oftentimes to be real specific without actually having contact with that family and, and knowledge that they might have of stories that they've been told about where the family came from so that we have sort of a place to go looking for records. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a brief question from the, a group of micaceous potters in Santa Fe who say that they are watching and listening as you speak, that the practice is alive and well, and they say thank you for the wonderful backstory. But then their question is, um, what was the original premise of the, the dig, the excavations? Why were you originally there? So the, the project was actually mostly documentation. So this happened as a, a an archaeological field school. I was teaching at Fort Lewis College at the time, and we had um, an obligation to offer regular archaeological field schools to train students in archaeological methods. And I had previously worked in CRM, um, and there were several management-oriented um, mapping and limited test excavation projects that had happened at this site when I was working um, in CRM and that I had been involved with because it was on Bureau of Reclamation land, and so they were responsible for knowing what was there and being able to manage it. And so the, the project was sort of designed to meet those two goals, to provide students with useful experience and training, um, but also to help more completely document elements of the site that were um, maybe a bit understudied or about which we really wanted to know more. So we were doing, in addition, we did do test excavations in some of these domestic contexts. Um, to help figure out what structures were occupied sort of by who and when and to teach students excavation methods. But the bulk of what we actually did in this project was a lot of surface documentation and recording of features, things like rock arts, um, structures that were, were falling down um, and other things that hadn't been completely recorded in the past. So, the, so I had a research interest because I had previously done research in the Upper Pecos to think about sort of the um, impact of the Homestead Acts for people who are more familiar with Spanish and Mexican community land grants, that whole legal context to think about how the this different legal framework, the Homestead Act, which kind of prioritized nuclear families and private property, how that might have influenced settlement practices. And so some of our recording related to that research, um, but it was, it was, at least as much about sort of managing and better documenting the site as it was about research. Thank you, excellent, thank you. Yeah, I had, was gonna read you one or two more thoughts about things. Um, <clears throat> we've got one comment, just a woman says, something I've brought with me move after move are books I inherited from my Nana. I don't even read them that often, but I have memories of her reading them. Definitely brings me comfort. And um, another one, um, Jennifer says that this was just a beautiful presentation. I am a potter and know about these pots. I also have family from Spain, specifically an aunt who is no longer with us, who was an extraordinary cook. Her pots were old and beaten up, but could not be replaced by anything new. I wonder how, how these feelings about cooking and cookware have been ignored in the advent of a fast food and restaurant dense society and how this will endure and be preserved with the way we eat nowadays. 
And she says, thank you. So I think you've touched some, got us all thinking a bit. I think I had another one question or so I was gonna throw at you just for the fun of it. So John Welch would like to know what's next. Have the research consultants had an opportunity to review the research results and assist in planning um, the, the prospects? I think that's what he meant, prospects of follow-up studies. Shannon, you wanna tackle that? <laughs> You can later beat up John in his office. You know. Yeah, I thought I was done with this. Yeah, yeah, you can you can beat him up later when we can all get back together again. <laughs> I mean, I can add from my side. I don't have any immediate plans to do more work at Los Ojitos. This is um, project that there there's some additional reporting I need to do of work that's that's been completed. Sort of. Um, uh, publications that I still need to complete. We did the initial field project um, and Shannon did this this kind of study of the micaceous pottery for her master's. Um, and we also did some targeted oral history and research on the Asequia system. So one of the people mentioned in the acknowledgement slides is Tara Del Piero Duran. And her master's research actually focused on that on on those springs. So it's named Los Ojitos because there were springs and I'm looking at the ways that people managed water at the site. And she was the one uh, who actually interviewed Ernesto and, and was able to talk to some people out there. But that, her master's is completed and that work has been presented. Um, something that is sort of, well, sad from my perspective, um, the, the people that so Mark Hungerford at Reclamation was a big champion of uh, work at Los Ojitos, also Jeff Hansen, who previously worked there. Um, and we're really grateful to them to allowing us to access the site and, and helping people like um, Ernesto Chavez and then be able to come out and visit the site. Uh, Mark unfortunately passed away last year. Um, and so that's kind of left some of some of the existing contacts with this site out. There's also been some changes in the private ownership of ranch lands that surround the site. So it can be a difficult site to access without going through those lands. So there, there's potential for later projects, but there's no immediate plans. That's a politically, <laughs> sufficiently political response. Oh. Ooh, I oh, I did wanna say just really quickly, I did notice one of the comments um, Dr. Herrera had mentioned Vic's vapor of jars and, and how those are connected to ideas of, of kind of classic, you know, remedios and, and especially in, in the Southwest and in Mexican families and how that's part of the carencia. And it's funny because I was mentioning Vic's vapor of jars recently to my archaeology classes as also a really uh, useful tie into the, the times we're living in in the pandemic because you see those jars become really popular, the VIX in particular as a patent medicine becomes really popular after the Spanish flu. Um, that's where it goes from being sort of local but not very common to everywhere. And yeah, it, it's certainly, there's like the VIX vapo, VIX vapo rub side of my family and the mental item side of my family, but it, it is present throughout. I know Vic's Vapo Rug is, is a part of my, my history and yeah, home too. So definitely, yeah. Well, maybe we'll leave it on that with the Vic's Vapo Rug, rug as, a, as a sign of home for everybody. Thank you so much. There's still some more questions, but we're gonna let um, Shannon and Kelly go through them and sort of compile some answers and, um, and responses and stuff. And we'll post that stuff all up on, um, on our website later. Um, Bill, were you going to come back and um, wrap us up? There I am. OK. <laughs> so, I wanted to thank uh, Shannon and Kelly. So many archaeologists uh, start a presentation with, we found a million sherds, and we're going to talk about it. Um, but you came at it with, we found just very few things, and we've really seriously and in-depth thought about it. And thank you for a really um, humanistic and, and uh, scientific and, and uh, well thought out presentation. So good job. And uh, Shannon, you'll get a chance to um, just 
from the other side of the uh, equation a month from now, um, pick at John, John Welch, because he's going to be our presenter um, at, at the first uh, presentation in January. So January 5th, um, and I think we're all looking forward to moving into 2021. So I wish you all a very pleasant holiday season and transitioning out of 2020. But John's going to be uh, speaking to us. He's the director of our, our landscape and site protection program. And it's called, his topic is protected places archaeology Southwest's conservation properties and their emerging roles in preservation archaeology. So uh, John, get ready for some tough questions from uh, today's speakers. And we look forward to having you all back with us in the new year. So thanks again, everyone. <laughs>